On 28th of July 2018, an ATR 72 operated by Air Vanuatu landed at Barberfield International Airport in Port Vila, the capital of Vanuatu. After touchdown, the aircraft went off the runway and collided with two small aircraft parked on apron. How can that happen? Hi, my name is Magnar Nordahl. I'm an ATA typewriting instructor and captain. And this channel is all about aviation. Today, I will talk about the importance of not rushing into quick conclusions when something unexpected happens. There are some situations where you have very little time to react, for example, if you get an engine failure just before or after we won, the takeoff decision speed. In such cases, we have memory actions, which are a set of actions we learn during our typewriting training. And from then on, every time you sit in a cockpit, you must know the memory actions by heart. In emergency checklists, the memory actions are marked with a box. So, when an emergency happens, we do the memory actions first, then we read the checklist. In all other cases, you have time to collect as much information as possible and get an understanding of the situation before you decide what to do. You must also be aware of the fact that the emergency checklists cannot cover every combination of failures. Therefore, you need a good understanding of the systems. Also, it's very important that both pilots are able to communicate and work efficiently together. This is what we call Crew Resource Management, CRM. And one of the tools we are using is the SOP, the Standard Operating Procedures. This is a manual that tells us what to do when we are operating the aircraft. The case we will look into today is Air Vanuatu Flight 241. What started as an engine problem developed into issues involving the air condition system, the electrical system, the hydraulic system, and the flight control system. This happened because the captain made some quick decisions that, unluckily, were wrong. Vanuatu is a nation in the Pacific Ocean. The capital is Port Vila. Air Vanuatu is the national carrier of Vanuatu. In 2019, the fleet consisted of a Boeing 737-800, two ATR-72-500, three De Havilland Canada-6 Twin Otter, and three Britain Norman BN-2 Islanders. Flight 241 was on a scheduled flight from Whitecross Airport in Tana to Barberfield Airport in Port Vila. There were 39 passengers on board. The crew consisted of two pilots and two cabin crew. The captain was 34 years at the time of the event, he was training captain and ATR fleet manager. He had a total of 7,205 hours, a year of 3,870 hours on ATR 72500. At the time of the accident, he was conducting line training with the first officer. The first officer was 27 years. He had a total of 1,629 hours, a year of 55 hours on ATR 72. ATR-72 is a high-wing turboprop aircraft powered by two Pratt & Whitney Canada PW-127M engines. It has a capacity of 70 passengers. The accident aircraft is registered Yankee Juliet Alpha Victor 71. The engine consists of a gas turbine, similar to a jet engine, powering a propeller via gearbox. The gearbox is driven by the power turbine via the turbine shaft. They are all shown in blue on this drawing. The turbine shaft rotates freely and this defines the engine as a free turbine turboprop. The gas turbine has two shafts, each attached to a compressor and a turbine. The shaft shown in green is called the low pressure or LP shaft. It's rotating freely outside the turbine shaft. At the front there's a low pressure compressor and at the aft there's a low pressure turbine. 
which drives the compressor. The final shaft is outside the LP shaft and is called a high pressure or HP shaft. It is also rotating freely and in opposite direction of the LP shaft. At the front there is a high pressure compressor and at the aft there is a high pressure turbine. It drives the compressor and a gearbox that is not shown here. This gearbox drives the DC generator, the fuel pump and the oil pump. To sum it up, we have three shafts mounted outside each other and rotating individually of each other. On top of the engine, you can see some ducts. They supply air called bleed air from the compressors to the air conditioning system. Engine number two, the one on the right side, was manufactured in 2009 and had accumulated a total of 10,000 hours and 12,000 cycles. In 2016, while installed in another Air Vanuatu ATR-72, the engine sustained an engine failure. The engine was removed from the aircraft and kept in storage for two years. In April 2018, the engine was sent to Germany and repaired. On 15 of July 2018, the engine was installed on the right wing of Yankee Juliet Alpha Victor 71. On 22nd July, during taxi, the engine sustained an oil leak. The next day the engine was repaired and released to service. On 25th of July, during flight, the oil pressure dropped to 42 psi. It should have been about 60 to 65 psi. After landing, the oil was seen dripping from the nacelle and the engine was shut down. They repaired the engine again, and this time the mechanic required a test flight. On 28th of July, the aircraft made a successful test flight, and the aircraft was released for service. Later that day, on the accident flight, the engine failed completely. After the accident, the engine was sent to Canada and disassembled by Pratt & Whitney. Both the low pressure and the high pressure shafts were seized. Metallic particles were found in the oil filters and the ship detectors. There was evidence of internal oil leak, allowing for the oil to enter air conditioning unit number two. The engine failure started when bearing number three fractured and caused the LP shaft to move around. This started a chain reaction of destruction inside the engine. Now, let's see what happened during that flight. The first officer was pilot flying. While cruising at flight level 160, which is 16,000 feet, and about 60 nautical miles from Port Villa, load banks were heard from the right engine, similar to compressor stall, also called engine stall. This can happen when the airflow into the engine is disturbed. The inter-turbine temperature, ITT, increased rapidly and exceeded its limit. This triggered an alarm. The captain took control. Many captains will do the same in a situation like this. But when you fly with an inexperienced pilot, he or she should be given the most easy job. Now, what is most easy to do? Fly the airplane or troubleshoot a technical problem? Consequently, the captain had to fly the aircraft and deal with the problem. Strangely, the captain reduced the power on both engines. However, only engine number two had a problem, so there was no reason to reduce the power of the other engine. In this situation, you can choose between two checklists, engine stall or abnormal engine parameters in flight. Because of the load banks, I will have selected the engine stall checklist. However, both checklists have the same ending. If the engine doesn't recover, you shut it down. The captain instructed the first officer to find the abnormal engine parameters in the flight checklist in the quick reference handbook, the QRH. While the first officer started to look for the procedure, the captain made a call to the cabin attendant on the interphone and informed about the situation. The cabin attendant informed the captain that smoke was entering the cabin from the right side. Now, that information was important. 
The engine on the right side had a problem and smoke was entering the cabin from the right side. If you add 1 and 1, what do you get? As I said before, the air conditioner received bleed air from the engine compressors. If there is an oil leak into the compressor, the oil will vaporize and enter the air conditioning system. ATR has two air conditioning systems. Engine 1, the one to the left, supplies air condition number 1. And engine number 2, the one to the right, supplies air condition number 2. Hot bleed air from the engine is cooled in the air conditioning units and then distributed to the cabin. Air condition number 1 supplies the cockpit and the left side of the cabin. And air condition number 2 supplies the right side of the cabin only. About 50% of the air is discarded through old flood valves, which are controlled by the pressurization system. The rest of the air goes through the recirculation fans, which are the yellow boxes on the figure. And then it's mixed with the air from the air condition unit. In this case, damage to engine number 2 caused oil to leak into air condition number 2 and spread to the cabin. This smoke is very toxic because oil contains some very nasty substances. When the mechanics refill oil in the engine, they always wear gloves because the oil can harm the skin. The captain immediately made a mayday call to ATC stating that they had smoke in the cabin and problem with one engine. And a few seconds later, they commenced a the descent. One minute had passed and the crew had still not started with the abnormal parameters in flight checklist. However, when the cabin crew reported that they had smoke in the cabin, the pilot should have started the smoke emergency checklist right away. Meanwhile, the smoke started to enter the cockpit. The pilots put on the oxygen masks and commenced the abnormal parameters in flight checklist. Finally. However, they had only completed the first item on the checklist when the captain interrupted the first officer and called the cabin attendant and asked for a smoke update. The cabin attendant confirmed that smoke was still entering the cabin. To sum it up, the captain knew that engine 2 had a problem and that smoke was entering the cabin. When they got smoke in the cockpit and had to don the oxygen masks, there were no doubt. Still, the captain did not call for a smoke checklist, neither did the first officer. Smoke is an emergency, period. Engine stall is not. It's, it was a major mistake not to commence the smoke checklist when they learned that smoke was in the cabin. Furthermore, if they had completed the abnormal parameters in the flight checklist right away, they would already have shut on engine long time ago and no more smoke would have entered the cabin. But the captain interrupted the first officer several times and prevented an efficient execution of the checklist. The accident report doesn't mention whether abnormal parameters in flight checklist was completed or not. However, the engine was not shut down at this time. The captain called the cabin crew and instructed her to don the PBE, the protective briefing equipment. The PBE is a hood with oxygen supply that lasts for at least 15 minutes. Every cabin attendant have access to a PBE. The captain then made a public address call, PA, and advised the packs to remain seated and await further instructions. While the captain was making the public address announcement, electric smoke alert was triggered. There's a smoke detector in the avionics ventilation system and it's connected to the centralized crew alert system or CCAS. The avionics produce a lot of heat and there's a fan pulling air out of the avionics compartments. The smoke detector is close to that fan. In this case, the smoke alert was not triggered by electric fire, but because the entire aircraft was filled with smoke from the air condition. The captain instructed the first officer to execute the electric smoke checklist. The first item on the checklist refers to the smoke checklist. The crew hastily completed the memory items of this checklist and then returned to continue with the electric smoke checklist. At least the recirculation fans were switched off. But this was a second mistake. 
They should have done the entire smoke checklist three minutes earlier when the cabin crew first reported smoke. But if they had completed the checklist, they could still have corrected the error they made before. Especially if they had read the line, a leg smoke may be activated by an air conditioning smoke source. And then they should have done an air conditioning smoke checklist and that would corrected everything. Instead, they did an electrical smoke checklist. And it goes like this. Smoke procedure apply. They did only the first part. Avionics went exhaust mode overboard. This improves the evacuation of smoke. Airflow high. This doubles the amount of air entering the cabin from the air conditioning systems. And that made the smoke condition in the cabin worse. The next actions are intended to reduce electrical loads and hopefully stop the electrical fire. DC service and utility bus off. This isolates non-essential electrical buses like lights in the cabin. DC bus tie contactor off. This will isolate DC bus 1 from DC bus 2 in case one of the generators has to be shut off during further troubleshooting. AC valve generator 1 and 2 off. This disables the main hydraulic pumps and many anti-icing systems such as the pitot heat, propeller heat. The rest of the checklist is about identifying the source of the smoke and isolate it. Then the crew may restore systems that are not affected. However, this part is not always emphasized during training. As the systems were disabled, the CCAS, the alert system, triggered more alerts. If you want to know more about the electrical and hydraulic systems, please check my videos about them. There is a link to each video in the description below. Shortly after, the cabin attendant called the captain and explained that the smoke in the cabin was intensifying. Oh yes, they were receiving more smoke than ever. The captain never understood that this was an air-conditioned smoke situation. And soon it would get even worse. The engine had lost a lot of oil. Consequently, engine number two low oil pressure warning was triggered. The engine lubrication system has a low pressure switch and a pressure transducer. The low pressure switch triggers the CCAS, the alert system, when oil pressure is below 40 psi. And you will get a master warning with all the bells and whistles. The pressure transducer is connected to the oil pressure indicator. A red light in the indicator illuminates when the oil pressure is below 40 psi. A note, this system is different from aircraft with glass cockpit. If you get a CCAS alert and a red light on the indicator, then there is no doubt we have lost the oil pressure. But if the pressure indicator shows low pressure and the CCAS does not give an alert, then you're not sure. The low pressure switch may have failed, but you don't know. Or if the CCAS gives an alert, but the oil pressure indicator tells otherwise, you might be confused as well. The captain instructed the first officer to find the engine low oil pressure checklist. This checklist has three conditions and the first officer was not able to figure out how to use it. The captain had to show the first officer which section he should read. After 90 seconds, the engine was shut down. In all, it took eight minutes from the first engine surge until the engine was shut down. Finally, no more smoke was entering the cabin, but it would not disappear before they had landed. Checklists are made with the concept that only a single system fails and, if relevant, systems affected by that single failure. It is just not possible to make checklists that can cover all combination of failures. The execution of electric smoke procedure and the shutdown of engine number two was a receipt for some very interesting uh, surprises. 
Switching off both AC valve generators will disable both the main hydraulic pumps. However, the blue hydraulic system has an auxiliary pump for that purpose. When you select the landing gear down, the auxiliary pump starts to run and provides hydraulic power to the emergency brake, the spoilers, the flaps, the propeller brake and the nose steering, everything you need for approach and landing. You don't have normal brakes, but you have the emergency brake and the landing gear must be lowered by gravity. No big deal. But here is the catch. The automatic function of the auxiliary pump is powered by DC bus 2. When the crew executed the electric smoke procedure, they set the bus type contactor, BTC, to isolate. Then they shut off engine number 2, which meant that DC generator 2 went offline. This resulted in the loss of DC bus 2. Therefore, when the landing gear lever was selected down, the auxiliary pump did not start. However, the pump can be activated by pressing the hydraulic auxiliary pump push button, even when it's labeled ground control only. This little secret is known by most ATR pilots. One more thing, the automatic function of the rudder travel limitation unit, the TLU, is also powered by DC bus 2. The TLU restricts the movement of the rudder at high speed to plus minus 4 degrees, preventing excessive loads on the vertical stabilizer. At low speed, that's below 180 knots, the rudder travel is plus minus 28 degrees. When the aircraft decelerates to a speed below 180, the TLU switches automatically back to low speed mode and a green light is illuminated on the central instrument panel. If the auto function is lost in flight, the TLU will remain in high speed mode. The solution is to select the TLU to low speed manually. The captain instructed the first officer to check and confirm that they had completed the electrical smoke checklist. The first officer pointed out that AC valve generator 1 plus 2 loss checklist was not done. So the captain ordered the first officer to read that checklist. When the first officer started with the before landing section of that checklist, the captain intervened and instructed him to reserve that section and continue with the rest of the checklist. The first officer complied and skipped the before landing section and continued with the rest of the checklist. The after touchdown section states that normal brakes are lost and reverse may be used as required and that the parking brake handle can be set to emergency. However, use of reverse is not recommended when you land with one engine inoperative. Before the first officer could finish the checklist, the captain told him to start again from the top. The first officer started on the checklist again, but before he could finish the first item, the captain interrupted again and said we need to do the single engine operation checklist. This checklist should have been executed when the engine had been shut down. All those interruptions made it difficult for the first officer to do his job properly, and important information may have been lost. The captain flew a visual approach manually, and at 1900 feet the landing gear lever was selected down. Since the auxiliary pump didn't run, the captain pressed the hydraulic auxiliary pump push button, and the blue hydraulic system was pressurized and I extended the flaps to landing position. For the landing gear extension, the captain handed control to the first officer and then he performed the manual landing gear extension procedure from memory and extended the landing gear. Then the captain resumed control of the aircraft. When the aircraft was 5 nautical miles from the airport, the captain instructed the first officer to refer back to the before landing section of the AC valve generator 1 plus 2 loss checklist. And this checklist confirmed that flaps and landing gear were set for landing. However, they did not do the before landing checklist. And that was the third big mistake. As I mentioned earlier, loss of DC bus 2 disabled the automatic function of the TLU. The TLU is one of the items on the before landing checklist because it's so critical, especially when landing with one engine inoperative. 
But since they did not do the before landing checklist, they didn't check that the green low speed light was illuminated. The captain made a short approach and was established on final at 330 feet and one nautical mile from the runway. The captain made a brace brace call on the public address system. The aircraft landed in the touchdown area about 400 meters past the threshold. The landing was good. However, from now on, the captain lost it all. One second after landing, both power levers were set to max reverse for a second. You don't do that. This caused the aircraft to veer to the left. The power levers were returned to ground idle for three seconds, and then full reverse was selected again for a second. The aircraft exited the runway, entered the grass, crossed the taxiway and came to stop after hitting two parked aircraft on the apron. After the accident, the captain testified that he had no directional control and no braking. The TLU was in high speed mode and restricted the use of the rudder. Furthermore, the neutral position of the TLU had incorrectly been set to 3 degrees left. Therefore, the rudder could only be deflected 1 degree to the right. The captain did remember to activate the hydraulic auxiliary pump before he extended the flaps, but he did not do that before landing. That left the nose steering inoperative. And of course, the emergency brake was available all the time. But he forgot that. I guess he forgot it because of a startling effect when he discovered that he had no rudder. Finally, why did he use reverse at all? The runway is 2,600 meters long. He could have stayed on the runway if he did not use the reverse. Probably he wanted to stop as soon as possible because of the smoke in the cabin and he wanted to evacuate the passengers. As soon as the aircraft came to the stop, the captain gave the command to evacuate. The cabin crew conducted an orderly expedited evacuation. Nobody were injured, but some media reported that 13 passengers were treated for smoke inhalation. However, this was not mentioned in the accident report. Here are some of the findings in the accident report. 1. Apart from the engine, none of the aircraft systems malfunctioned in flight. The loss and unavailability of those systems was induced by flight crew action. 2. The emergency brake was available but was not used by the crew. 3. The flight crew's actions and statements indicated that their knowledge and understanding of the aircraft systems were not adequate. The co-pilot's limited experience flying the ATR and deficiency in system knowledge and checklist knowledge contributed to inadequate CRM, crew coordination and steep cockpit authority gradient. 5. The captain was not current with smoke procedures. His training for smoke procedure had expired. I fully agree with those findings, and there is one more thing. The captain only responded to smoke alerts given by the alerting system. The fact that the cabin and later the cockpit were filled with smoke did not trigger any other action than putting on the oxygen masks. And this raises some questions about smoke training. Is it realistic enough? Do the simulators replicate smoke scenarios as they should? And do the briefings prepare us for the right thing? My experience is that smoke training in simulator is not always realistic. It's either all or nothing. The smoke generators are the same as used on rock concerts. They are very effective. And that means the smoke is very thick. But smoke can also be very thin in real life but still very toxic. Some simulators cannot reproduce air-conditioned smoke, and when they do, the smoke is coming from a single air vent. In the real world, the smoke will come from every air duct in the cockpit, because they are supplied from the same air-conditioned unit. 
And if the simulator cannot replicate air-conditioned smoke, you will only see smoke in the simulator when you practice electrical smoke. In that case, the smoke is coming from an avionics panel. However, this is not always realistic either, because the avionics are ventilated by a very strong fan, the extract fan. Therefore, you may not see any smoke at all when you get the alert. However, when a smoke alert is triggered, the extract fan stops. And this may cause smoke to enter the cockpit. Therefore, a good briefing is always very important when you do smoke training. <sighs> what can we learn from this? First of all, know your aircraft, know your procedures, and follow your procedures. And when something happens, don't rush. In most cases, you have plenty of time to assess the situation before you decide what to do next. And don't forget to check the TLU low speed light before landing, please. That's all for this time. Please support this channel by clicking like, subscribe and share with your friends. And thank you for your comments. I love to read them. Thank you for watching and happy landing.